Open your Bibles, if you would, please, with me to the book of Matthew, chapter 22. Matthew, chapter 22. In Matthew chapter 22, I'm going to start reading in verse 34. Matthew chapter 22, verse 34. But when the Pharisees had heard that he, Jesus, had put the Sadducees to silence, they were gathered together. Now, if you've done any study at all in the Gospels, you know that the Pharisees and the Sadducees, both the mortal enemies of Christ, were also religious and political enemies between themselves. They had very little affinity for each other much less affection. They fought constantly. If you kind of want to think of it in verbiage that maybe we can relate to in our dumbed down language in 2023, the Sadducees would have been the theologians on the left, and the Pharisees were the theologians on the right. It, that helps maybe a little perspective. But they despised each other, just like people on the left and people on the right do today. Not too much has changed. But even though they hated each other, they hated Jesus more then they hated each other. The Pharisees gathered together, the King James tells us, plotted together, conspired together, however you want to say it, to be the ones to trick Jesus into saying something unlawful. That's what the Sadducees tried to do and failed. They tried to entrap him in his speech to get him to say something that was against the law of Moses. And they tried and tried and tried and failed. And finally, they quit trying. That's why it says they were put to silence. They didn't have anything left to say. They had exhausted every argument that they could muster to try and trick Jesus in his speech. So the Pharisees came together, plotted together, to try and pick up where the Sadducees left off. The idea here is that, well, the Sadducees weren't able to trap Jesus because they're not as smart as we are. We're a lot smarter than the Sadducees, and so we're going to be able to do what they failed to do. That's the idea. There's an old saying, nothing brings people together like a common enemy. Instead of accepting Christ's victory over the Sadducees, the Pharisees join the Sadducees in opposing Christ. They should have been happy that Jesus put the Sadducees in their place regarding the resurrection and a future state, which the Pharisees believed, of course. Instead, they are bitter against Christ for his opposition to their hypocrisy and tyranny. So it didn't matter that Jesus had just done the Pharisees job for them in destroying the Sadducees agenda of there's no resurrection the Pharisees pick up the ball take the side of the Sadducees 
and continue the attack against the Lord Jesus Christ. Verse 35, then one of them, which was a lawyer, asked him a question, tempting him and saying, okay, they chose a lawyer to tempt Christ. You know, you know lawyers speak. What is is? And you younger people are going, you don't remember Bill Clinton. Uh, he's a lawyer. And when he said that on national television, he was using lawyer speak. What is is? So he, they bring a lawyer to try and, again, tempt Christ. But there's something you need to understand here. And this is what a lot of evangelicals don't know. And I was never taught. I had to learn it for myself. The Pharisees were lawyers first and rabbis second. And the same is true today. Most Jewish rabbis are lawyers first, and then they are rabbis. They use their skills in the law and the knowledge of religion as a means of winning arguments and convincing people, etc. But they are lawyers first. They are rabbis second. Don't ever forget that. Verse 36. Master, this lawyer rabbi says, what is the great commandment in the law? Again, he's trying to trap Jesus into saying something that could be accused as being unlawful under the Mosaic law. That's what they're trying to do. Which is the great commandment in the law? Now here's why he asked that question. Within the Pharisees, there was wide discussion and debate over that question. Which is the great commandment in the law? And the Pharisees debated this perennially. Some Pharisees said the law of the Sabbath was the greatest commandment. Others said the law of circumcision was the greatest commandment. Some of the Pharisees said the law of sacrifices was the greatest commandment. And still others said that the ceremonial laws formed the greatest commandment. So there was wide disparity of thought within the Pharisees as to which was the greatest commandment. And so he asked Jesus that question, which is the great commandment in the law? None of the Pharisees, they debated all of these subjects I just mentioned, but none of them understood the purpose and meaning of the law. None of them. They had all these deep theological discussions about the law, and yet none of them understood the purpose and meaning of the law. Many Christians today argue and debate the finer aspects of Christianity. Oh, how good they are at arguing these finer points. But they have almost no comprehension of the true New Covenant gospel. If one does not understand the basic 
fundamental truth of the new covenant, he or she cannot understand the finer points of Christian teaching. You can debate all of that until the cows come home, wherever those cows are that never get home. Until they get home. And it will do you no good if you do not have an adequate, thorough understanding of the new covenant gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. <clears throat> Prophecy message number 11, the preeminence of the new covenant and abolishment of the old covenant. And I put this in the, the Revelation prophecy series because the book of Revelation is not primarily a book about prophecy. It is a book about the new covenant. It is explaining the new covenant of the Lord Jesus Christ. And I have to confess that through all of my ministerial training and the colleges that I attended and the degrees that I earned and all of the experience I had in that educated environment, I will confess to you that I never was taught thoroughly and completely the new covenant gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. And I will say to you that at least 80% of all evangelical Christians in America today do not understand the true New Covenant gospel. If they did, they could not believe Schofield futurism. It would be impossible to embrace that heretical doctrine if you understood the true New Covenant gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. I encourage you to watch that DVD. It's so important. That's why I put it in the prophecy package. Verse 37. And Jesus said unto them, okay, he's answering the question. Remember, what is the great commandment in the law? Here's Jesus' answer. Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart with all thy soul, with all thy mind. This is the first and great commandment. <laughs> they hadn't even thought about that. He didn't talk about the Sabbath. He didn't talk about circumcision. He didn't talk about the sacrifices. He didn't talk about the ceremonial laws. He said the first and great commandment is thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, with all thy soul, with all thy mind. And the second, he added, is like unto it. Thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. On these, look at it very carefully, on these two commandments, love God with all your heart, Love your neighbor as yourself. On these two commandments hang all the law and the prophets. The entire Old Testament hangs on these two laws. Love God with all your heart. Love your neighbor as yourself. Now Mark's gospel includes Jesus opening remark that Matthew leaves out. And here is what Jesus said that is added by Mark in his gospel. The first of all the commandments is, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord. So that's what he said first. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord. And then he said, Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thine heart. 
That, of course, is taken from Deuteronomy chapter 6 and verse 4. I think it's important that we include Mark's version of, of Jesus' statement, a full statement, because before understanding what God said, we must understand who God is. And that's the problem in modern Christianity. We have a lot of people who have no idea who God is that are trying to understand what he said. Until you understand who God is, you'll never be able to understand what he said. That's why that's important when he put that in. The Lord our God is one Lord. He is one Lord. You cannot begin to understand Christian doctrine if you do not understand that Jesus is the Lord Jesus Christ. The Lord Jesus Christ, which means he is above all. He is King of kings, Lord of lords. He is the God-man, the Son of God, and God the Son. Any religion that denies Christ's deity and his sole kingship is not Christian. And there's a lot of religions in the country today. They say they worship Jesus Christ and they lie. They deny his deity. They deny that he is Lord of all. Co-equal with God the Father in all manner of divine attributes, including creation. Jesus is our creator become Savior. John 1, 1 in the beginning was the Word, capital W, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Skip down a few verses. And the world was made by him. He is our creator become our savior. He is one Lord. Any religion that makes other men equal with Christ is not Christian. And I'm, I'm telling you, I mean, we could go down the list here and name religious organizations, but I'm telling you that the litmus test by which all religions must be judged. I shouldn't have to tell you which religions are cults, which religions are false. If you know who God is, if you know who Christ is, you will immediately recognize the imposters among the church. Just as if you know how to spot a genuine dollar bill, I had to learn this when I worked in retail, when you know how to spot a genuine dollar bill, you don't have to be instructed on what a counterfeit looks like. When you know the genuine article, you can spot a phony a mile away. When you know true New Covenant gospel doctrine, you can spot false teaching a mile away. You don't have to be spoon-fed every little truth when you understand the basic truth of New Covenant doctrine. Now Jesus answers, Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, with all thy soul, with all thy mind. And the second is like unto it, Thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. The second law, the first one came from Deuteronomy. The second law comes from Leviticus chapter 19 and verse 18, which says, Thou shalt not avenge nor bear any grudge against the children of thy people, 
but thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. I am the Lord. Again, that's Leviticus 19.18. Then Jesus said, as I've already qu quoted, on these two commandments hang all the law and the prophets. Obviously, the Pharisees had not thought of that. Love was not a high priority among the Pharisees, to say the least. And to say, love your neighbor as yourself, that was never in the discussion. On these two commandments, hang all the law and the prophets. I'm going to give you this verse. I'm not going to have you turn to it, but I'm going to read it very slowly and carefully. I want you to, to, to take a note and look at this verse when you have time a little bit more in depth. Romans chapter 13 and verse 10. Romans 13, 10. Listen very carefully. Love worketh no ill to his neighbor. Love worketh no ill to his neighbor. Therefore, love is the fulfilling of the law. Love is the fulfilling of the law, the law of Moses. Did you hear that? Love worketh no ill against his neighbor. No harm. No ill intent against your neighbor. Therefore, love is the fulfilling of the law. Love is the fulfillment of the commandments. Love is the first thing that God expects of his children. Christ, who is love incarnate, completely fulfilled the law for those who trust Christ. When a Christian lives in the love of Christ toward God and each other, the law is fulfilled. Listen to 1 John chapter 4, verses 20 and 21. If a man say, I love God, and hateth his brother, he is a liar, for he that loveth not his brother whom he hath seen, how can he love God whom he hath not seen? And listen to this last phrase. And this commandment we have from him, Christ, that he who loveth God love his brother also. When we don't love God as we ought, and when we don't love one another as we ought, it reflects upon our own lack of character, our own lack of integrity, our own lack of honesty, in other words, our own sin. Dishonest people believe everyone else to be dishonest. Selfish people believe everyone else is selfish. In other words, the mistreatment of people simply, is simply a reflection of the guilt and shame 
in the heart of the one who mistreats. When someone mistreats a brother or a sister, it is a reflection of the sin of their own soul. In our text, Jesus reduces all of the law, all of the Old Testament law, down to two laws. Think about it. He compresses the entire Mosaic law into two laws. Love God and love your neighbor. And then in Matthew chapter 7 and verse 12, he reduces these two laws into one law. Matthew 7, 12. Therefore, all things whatsoever ye would that men should do to you, do ye even so to them, for this is the law and the prophets. We call that the golden rule. All things whatsoever ye would that men do to you, do ye even unto them, For this one law is the law and the prophets. The Old Testament is condensed to one law. Do unto others what you want them to do unto you. Now, this means that rituals and ceremonies must give way to that law. Spiritual gifts must give way to that law. Personal preferences must give way to that law. Do unto others as you would have them do unto you, for this is the law and the prophets. Genesis to Malachi. Or you could even include John the Baptist. Somebody watched me preach one day and take drinks of water occasionally. And he said, that man is the only windmill I have ever known that's run by water. (laughs) I have used this story more than once. A few that have watched for a long time and those of you that have been here for a while you've heard this before Uh, you'll probably hear it again because when it happened it sank so deeply into my soul that I've never been able to forget it the absolute horror of it the magnitude of the gore was so strong. The smell, the stench was so putrid in my soul that I've never been able to forget it. And it applies to so many things that we talk about from this pulpit as it does today. Back in 2012, you you probably saw it, at least many of you. The champion of liberty in America, Dr. Ron Paul, was in a presidential primary debate in South Carolina. This was 2008, uh, excuse me, 2012. And there were several Republicans that were on the stage. And the question was asked of Dr. Paul if he would summarize his philosophy of foreign policy. And Dr. Paul, 
a dedicated Christian man, my friend, said, my philosophy would be the words of our Savior who said that we should treat others as we would like to be treated. I don't know that there could have ever been a greater answer to that question than the answer that Dr. Paul gave. But the response among the Republicans in the audience, most of whom were Christians, South Carolina, for those of you who do not know, is home to more Christians, evangelical Christians, and more evangelical churches per capita than any state in the United States. And they keep re-electing Lindsey Graham to the Senate. You figure that out. Those Republicans, many of them Christians, in South Carolina, when they heard Ron Paul introduce Jesus' words into the debate, treat others as we would like to be treated, they booed him in a deafening roar, almost driving him off of the platform in anger. As I watched that, I could not believe what I was witnessing what I was hearing, and what I was seeing. Christians who say they love God. And yet God, Jesus, took the commandment to love God with all your heart and all your mind, and he reduced it to a commandment saying, treat others as you want to be treated. And they booed him. They were, boo they were not booing Ron Paul. They were booing the words of Jesus Christ. And they threw their support to one of America's biggest warmongers, John McCain. That really worked out well, didn't it? God really blessed America with that one. How could Christians show such disdain for such an important biblical teaching? So important that Jesus said, this is the whole law and the prophets. Have they forgotten that Jesus said, blessed are the peacemakers? Well, yeah, they have, or they never learned it to begin with. The Apostle John told us, if you hate your brother, you are a murderer. So what does it matter to Christians to kill people halfway around the world, especially if someone else is doing the killing? Many Christians have developed a Caesarean might makes right kind of patriotism where end justifies the means and they have no concept whatsoever of the natural laws of God regarding the taking of human life. Amen. I submit that the Christians who are so quick to condemn Russia for its war in Ukraine but sit back in utter silence and indifference to the Israeli war on the Palestinians are among the greatest of hypocrites in the world. When Pharaoh ordered the killing of innocent children, was he justified? When Herod ordered the killing of innocent children, was he justified? 
Is killing justified merely because a king, potentate, ruler, or president orders it? Is the killing of innocent, unborn babies justified merely because it is the law of the land in some states? We can stand here today and thank God that our Supreme Court this past year overturned Roe v. Wade nationally. But here in Montana, we need to make sure that our pro-life Republican majority, a super majority in our legislature, passes a personhood amendment this session. Go ahead and put up that on the screen. Some of the strongest opponents, now listen to me, those of you across the state of Montana, please listen very carefully. And you and other states, I'm sure, have similar legislation being introduced in many of your states as well. So it's applicable to states throughout the country. Some of the strongest opponents of the personhood amendment are coming from within the Republican Party and from the Montana Family Foundation, a subsidiary of James Dobson's Focus on the Family. The organization that professes to be the guardian of the unborn and the champion of the pro-life cause is one of the leading opponents of the personhood amendment here in Montana. The truth is, they are more afraid of the media than they are of God. They're not willing to take the heat from the liberal press. And so they want to avoid the issue by not having to vote on it. But I am happily able to announce to all of you today that here in Montana, we have a House representative by the name of Bob Phelan who is sponsoring Montana's personhood amendment. Yeah. <laughs> On your screen, those of you that are watching right now, you are seeing the email address for Representative Phelan. I am urging all of you whether you live in Montana or not, to write Bob an email today, tomorrow morning at the latest, and thank him for sponsoring Montana's personhood amendment. Because when that passes in the state of Montana, it's going to be the gold standard for states all over America. Please take a minute and email Congressman Phelan and thank him for having the courage to sponsor this bill. Encourage him to not give in to opposition from within his own party or his own party leadership. Encourage him to stay the course, let him know that you're praying for him, let him know you appreciate him. That is very, very important. We'll leave that address up for about a minute, and then we'll take it down. I'll give you time to get a pen and jot it down. Please do that as soon as you can. The foundational Christian principle 
to love God and each other is still the cornerstone principle upon which the entire Bible rests. It is the foundational principle of Liberty Fellowship. It should be the foundational principle that governs our attitudes and conduct toward our spiritual family here at the fellowship especially. How can Christians send Bibles and missionaries around the world to spread the love of Christ and then turn around and support and cheer when our government sends aircraft carriers, jet bombers, and missiles to wreak havoc and rain down death and destruction upon people almost at will with no constitutional authority or accountability, no remorse, no concern for the consequences that we are creating, not only for the people around the world that we are victimizing, but for our own children and grandchildren. How can Christians behave so sinfully? And how can Christian legislators claim to love Christ and not sacrificially and courageously do everything they can to protect the lives of innocent, unborn children. It shouldn't matter what the media says. It shouldn't matter what some skewed opinion poll says. It shouldn't matter what their fellow legislators say. It shouldn't matter what their leadership says. It shouldn't matter who says what says. They should have in their hearts enough love for God and their fellow man to use every bit of power that has been given them as a state legislator or governor or whatever the office might be to preserve protect and defend our Constitution, and that means our unborn children. <laughs> Jesus said unto them, Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, with all thy soul, with all thy mind. This is the first and great commandment. And the second is like unto it, thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. On these two commandments hang all the law and the prophets. Let's stand for a closing word of prayer.